The HPV vaccination program was introduced in 2010 when first-year secondary school girls were offered a vaccine which protects against the major strains of the HPV virus that cause cervical cancer. Since then, concerns have been raised about the vaccine as some girls have claimed to have had adverse reactions to it. Last December, I spoke to 16-year-old Hannah Cummins. She says she has severe symptoms following the administration of the HPV vaccine Gardasil. Here's a little of what she told me about the changes to her life. The symptoms are horrific. I'm in bed nearly 22 hours a day when it's very bad. I have extreme headaches, extreme dizziness, soreness in my bones and in my joints. I get heart palpitations and I get very, very lightheaded. And any time I stand up, it's very bad because I get very dizzy and it's almost as if I'm going to fall. This is a condition where not enough blood is delivered to the brain yes. because of rising uh, suddenly. Uh, the, the impact on your education, uh, how much schooling do you get? I'm homeschooled now because I was missing so much school that I just couldn't keep up with the curriculum in school because I was missing too much at a time. And this is simply because if you were sitting in a desk in school and you stand up, that you're going to suffer these symptoms. Yes. So what do you do? Study kind of lying down at home? Yes, I study at home. I'm sitting most of the time or I'm lying down. I take periodically a rest in between. And that's how I study. It's very hard. How about your sporting activities, your swimming, your horse riding? It's non-existent. I can't do any sports without fainting. Are you convinced in your own mind that this is associated with the vaccine? Yes, because the timeline is very, very efficient. What have doctors been saying to you, though? Well, any time I go to a doctor, they acknowledge that the symptoms are present, and but they don't know what's caused it. They don't know why I'm having it. And then if I go to another doctor, they suggest that it's all psychosomatic, which is very hard for a teenage girl to understand when they're saying everything that you're feeling is all in your head. And that's uh, Hannah Cummins, to whom I spoke last December. Well, joining us now to talk about the rationale for the vaccine is Professor Margaret Stanley, a leading virologist at the University of Cambridge. Professor Stanley, you're welcome to the programme. Thank you very much. Now, nice can you, you explain to us exactly what the HPV vaccine is designed to do? The HPV vaccine is designed to prevent infection with um, the two most important uh, strains of this virus that cause cervical cancer. And they are HPV-16 and HPV-18. Uh, the one that's used in Ireland also pre uh, prevents the infection with another group of HPVs that cause warts. But the major importance of this vaccine is that it stops infection with two viruses that cause cervical cancer. Now, the cause and effect, I presume, is well proven. Absolutely. It's proven by huge epidemiological studies looking at uh, cohorts of people. In other words, large numbers of young women who are not infected. Then you follow them through for 20, 30 years to find out what happens to those who become infected. And what we know is that those who become infected develop the high-grade precancers that we know are the cause of cervical cancer. We know that because in the 1960s, there was a very unfortunate study in New Zealand in which women with these high-grade precancers were not treated properly. They were left in place. And in the next 20 years, those women developed cervical cancer. So we know that the virus causes the precancers and the cancers. And that's proven epidemiologically and it's proven in the lab. Now, you mentioned HPV-16 and HPV-18. It suggests that there are multiple human papilloma viruses. There are indeed. And there are 13 of these viruses that are known to have a role in cervix cancer. But 16 and 18 cause 70% of these cervix cancers around the world. And in some areas, particularly Europe, 16 and 18, particularly 16, probably play a bigger part. So I know from the UK, from Wales, because of a retrospective study that was done, that about 80% of cervix cancers in Wales is caused by 16, and about another 5% or so by 18. So you could see that by targeting these two viruses, 
we could have a massive effect. Now, is there also a link to head and neck cancer? That's absolutely right. It's two cancers that occur in the head and neck. Head and neck is a very complicated place with lots of different sites. But at the tonsils, the one right at the back of the throat, and the base of the tongue, uh, cancers that arise there, uh, we know now that at least 75% of them are caused by HPV, mainly HPV-16. And the problem with these cancers is that they are rising very, very fast. And it's men who have the big burden here. Men have three times as much of these cancers as women. And as I say, in the last, since the mid-80s, these cancers have increased by three times. So we are looking at a really very unfortunate situation. The way you contract the human papilloma virus, is it always through sexual contact? It is predominantly, but not exclusively. So um, you can acquire it in other ways, but it's, it's, it's a sexually transmitted infection. The dose that is given to uh, girls, it's a, a two-dose vaccine to be 100% effective. Is that so? If you're under the age of 15, yes. And this is a, initially the, the vaccine was delivered in three doses in the same way, for example, as hepatitis B vaccine is. But then it was shown very clearly that this vaccine is incredibly effective and it makes your body respond very uh, efficiently with antibodies. And it, particularly in uh, the 9 to 15 year olds, they make very strong antibody responses. So we could use two doses rather than three, which is not only cheaper, but it's easier on the person who's being vaccinated. But is, we don't do it if you're over 15. Over 15, you still have three doses. Now, is there any case for asking older women to uh, have this, you know, later on in life, in their 20s, in their 30s, and also the case for uh, asking men to have the vaccine? Well, in my opinion, the answer is yes to both of those. For older women, um, yes, they may have been exposed to the virus. They may have made... Um, you know, a, a immune response, a defense response, and had got rid of it apparently. But unfortunately, your natural um, immune response to these viruses is not a very good one. So you do remain vulnerable to being infected again. And that if you're vaccinated, the, va the response you make the vaccine is very strong, and it looks as though you really are um, resistant to reinfection, 10 probably. 20 years after the first vaccination. So older women can benefit because they'll be given protection, even though they may have been exposed. They won't be given protection if they have the infection at the time they are vaccinated, because this prevents, it does not treat infection. So, you know, from the individual as an old woman, I would strongly recommend that they get vaccinated because then they're protected against possible new disease. For men, the reason why you give vaccines is that you want to get as many people in the population immune as possible so that the chance of meeting up with somebody who's infected becomes less and less and less as more and more people yeah. are vaccinated and immune. So if you immunize men, not only do you protect the men from the disease, but you make the population as a whole really resistant to infection with this virus and the amount of virus almost becomes Extinct. Undetectable. Yeah. I mean, this is the, the herd immunity we often hear about Absolutely. in measles and uh, rubella, all of that kind of thing. All of that kind of thing. That's exactly what you're trying to do. Now, uh, the, the question of uh, cervical cancer, it, if you've been vaccinated successfully, that does not mean that you are completely free of a likelihood of, of getting cervical cancer. You could get it a different way. Um, well, you, you certainly wouldn't get it from HPV 16 and 18, but with the current two vaccines that are being used mainly around the world, you still have, a, you're only dealing with 7 out of 10 cervix cancers, so you need, still have 3 out of 10 that can arise because of infection with the other uh, cancer-causing viruses. There is a new vaccine on the market uh, which protects against 
seven of the cancer-causing viruses, including 16 and 18. And the um, prediction for that is that it would uh, get rid of 90% of cervix cancers. And so mm. if that vaccine uh, or new vaccines that are coming on stream um, become widely used, then I think we can agree that cervix cancer is going to become um, very, very rare indeed. Very rare. But you would not uh, counsel women who have had the vaccines and not to have a smear test. No, I certainly, I would certainly insist that they go on to have a smear test with the current vaccines because they are still at risk for the, these other types. And particularly, these other types cause them in the, they come on later, they cause them in the older women. So certainly women should not give up going for their smears, even though they've had the vaccine. Now, one of the controversial aspects of all of this is that the reported cases of young girls who have reacted badly to the HPV vaccination. And uh, having talked to some of them and read about some of their cases, they appear to be persuasive that suddenly, often in the immediate aftermath of a vaccine, you get these adverse reactions leading to to pain, discomfort, lethargy, uh, a lack of uh, performance in study and so on. Yes, well, there's a, this is a real, real issue for us all because we're giving this vaccine to 13 to 14-year-olds with often um, older teens coming in also to be vaccinated. Now, that is actually the period of time where these other rather ill-defined neurological situations uh, symptoms appear in girls, um, and I, you can. The sort of evidence for that is from uh, places like the Nordic countries, where they're very careful to actually look at the background rates of these uh, potential adverse events in their unvaccinated populations. There's just been a study from Finland doing that, and what you find is that the proportion. Uh, or the number of cases of uh, these events uh, in unvaccinated girls is no different to the number of cases in girls vaccinated. So from the population point of view, there's absolutely no evidence that the vaccine has any uh, if involvement in these situations. But that's not much help to, of course, to a family who very naturally think, well, you know, my daughter was fine and she had this vaccine two, three weeks later. She's just a changed girl. The trouble is that's not cause, it's coincidence. And the reason I'm so confident about that is because of, there have been huge studies, and I mean huge. We're talking about three, four million women uh, who have been looked at who have a proportion who are vaccinated and a proportion who are not vaccinated. And the incidence of these conditions has been no different between the two groups. Mm. That's why I'm confident that there's actually no relationship between the vaccine and these really very, un you know, it is very sad for the girl in yeah. her family for this to happen. I mean, there's one case of a, a young girl, 13 years old, got the first dose of Gardasil along with the T-TAP vaccine yeah. on September the 14th. She had an adverse reaction straight away. For an hour, she was left lying on a mat on the floor while the rest of the girls were being vaccinated. During the time, she had seizure-like jerking, rolling eyes, blurred vision, headache and nausea. The parents were called an hour and 20 minutes later and uh, they arrived at the school and uh, were told, look, <clears throat> this is a reaction, it'll wear off. But the next day, she had another seizure. She was a red-blue colour, unable to speak, chest pain, swollen joints. You know, that kind of thing. The coincidence seems too too much to but credit. But she also had Tdap at the same time. Yeah. It's interesting that there's assumption that it's HPV, not the Tdap. It could have been either. Yeah. But it wasn't. It but was in, in any medicine, thing. you know the way when you're taking any uh, medicine on prescription or whatever, and you're advised to read to read the leaflet, and you know many people have adverse reactions to different pharmaceuticals, like for example penicillin. Some people can't take penicillin, and there are other things. And you know, in in the food business, we know the anaphylactic reaction to nuts. Why would it be beyond um, acceptance by the medical profession that? that one or two people 
might have adverse reactions to these vaccines. I don't think any of us would discount the possibility of someone having an adverse reaction to the vaccine. What I'm saying is that the probability of this person having an adverse reaction to that specific event is no different to the probability that he or she would have had a similar reaction to some other injection, for example. And that's really what the evidence tells us. But nobody should think that any of these interventions are without risk. Life is a risky business. And the question is whether the risks that are attached to the vaccine are any greater than the risks attached to the disease. And I would say very simply that the side effects of the HPV vaccine are a sore arm, and sometimes a very sore arm. But the side effect of cervix cancer is death, and it's a very unpleasant death. Well, Professor Margaret Stanley, leading virologist at the University of Cambridge, thank you very much for joining us. And I know that uh, you'll be taking part in talks about the vaccine in the Clayton Hotel in Ballybrit in Galway tonight and the Oriel House Hotel in Ballacolic in Cork on Wednesday. And uh, I'm sure you'll have a, a very interested and receptive audience. Well, I'm sure they'll have lots of questions. Once again, Professor Margaret Stanley, thank you very much. And thank you.